is building a vanity. So the nearly forgotten vanity project actually isn't forgotten. Um, vanity is in fact installed right now and I'm waiting on my plumber friend to come over and do the granite with me partly to flip it up but also he wants to do a few plumbing changes in there, you know, change out some valves or some newer style and also we need to drop the, the drain further to the back wall. Now, when I say we, I mean I'm going to be holding his beer as a carrot, and then he's going to be doing the change. So I got to the point where it was finishing at the end of the last episode, and then of course the finishing cycle is kind of slow. I usually joke around that when you're at finishing, you're really at middling. That's what would be a better name, because in the whole scheme of things, you're about the midway point when you start the finishing cycle. So it took a little bit of time, and between that and some holidays and such, this is where we're at. So. Uh, the rest of this episode is going to show you how I did the wet sanding and a couple other things that I had to do for the top that you'll, you'll find out about when you get there. Uh, at the end of the episode, I'm going to tack on the part where you're going to see this installed on the vanity. And I'll go over a couple things like what I liked and what I didn't like about doing the project, what I would do differently, and what I thought actually came out better than expected. So, so I'll give a little summary at the end to kind of wrap up the project. All right, let's get to the finishing. So today I'm going to be doing the wet sanding of the panels and the drawer fronts. Now the first coat is the key coat for doing a wet sanding like this because the idea is that you're going to be sanding it with like your 600 grit paper uh, freehand or with block depending on where we are on the surface. And you're going to be taking the sanding dust and it's going to get worked back into the finish and pushed down into the pores. So it really fills it and it makes it that you're going to, it's just going to be glass smooth when you're done because there really are no pores left after the first coat. Now the first coat being the most important is because after the coat has been set, it's pretty much going to be sealed. You're going to be able to do a little bit more work on the second coat if there's a place that has a problem, but for the most part you want to kind of nail it on the first coat. Now when I do the wet sanding, I tend to use seal cell for the first two coats, and then afterwards I switch over to something like Armor Seal or whichever final one I want to use. Uh, with the Armor Seal, I tend to be able to pick the sheen that I want, so I might go through a couple gloss coats and then maybe finish it off with a satin coat. Whereas with the seal cell, I always just use the clear, and I use those for the first couple coats. Uh, why I don't use Armor Seal for the first ones, I've done it a few times with Armor Seal as the first one, and I tended to like the end result with seal cell. Whether that was that particular project or the particular technique I used, I don't know, but since then I've sort of stuck with that by using seal cell for the first two coats. Now the first coat, you want it to really soak in. You want it to get in as far as you can. And you want a decent working time when you're dealing with a panel this big, especially when I've got to work through some of these undulations and the sculpting parts. So what I'm going to do is I will be thinning this out at, I would thin it out minimum 50% mineral spirits to seal a cell. Uh, because of the size of this panel, I'm going to shoot for more like 75%. I don't care if it's going to take a little bit longer to flash off and set because I, honestly I'm not going to touch it until tomorrow anyway. Now the choice of using mineral spirits versus say one of the other derivatives like naphtha uh, naphtha flashes off faster, but my whole point here is I want more working time, so using the mineral spirits is actually ideal for me here. So after you sand it down the whole panel, you're going to want to wipe off the excess. So you're just going to need some, you know, grab some socks or something like that, preferably not your own socks. You'll be wiping across the grain in order not to lift dust out of the pores, and then you can just set it aside. Now in my case, I do need to finish the back side because this is being applied just with screws because of the wood motion issues. So I'll do the first part will be the top and then I'll do all, all the fronts and then later on today I'll take care of doing the backs and they can equal themselves out. Now for the backs obviously I'm not going to really take the time to sand it in. I'll just apply it and let it go because nobody will ever be able to see it. So I'm wearing my finishing and gluing shirt. It's a, uh, was my favorite shirt until I was carrying way too many things in my hands and I ripped it. So. I wear it for all my glue ups and I wear it for all my finishing. I have yet to get a drop of finish on it or a drop of glue on this shirt just because it's a scrap shirt. Now all my other ones that I accidentally have worn during finishing or glue up all have a mark. So take a shirt, put a hole in it, and it'll never get glue or oil on it.
So I've wet sanded the first two coats on here. I went through the first coat and by the time I got to the end, really the first one was ready to go for the second coat. Uh, but I went off to lunch to give it a little bit more time to kind of settle in there because I didn't want the second coat when I apply the pretty heavy mineral spirits on there to sort of lift anything that I had sanded in there before. So it works out really well that way and the stuff is just glass smooth already. I mean, it dries pretty quickly here in Arizona. It flashes off fast, which I will say actually that on the larger panels back here, Though I was using a, a 2 to 1 mineral spirits to silo cell ratio, uh, these ones here, when I would get to the other half, I would usually have to put a little bit more varnish on the first part. So once I would get to this half here, I would have to go back and put a little bit of varnish up here and just wet sand a little just to keep it wet, uh, keep kind of a wet edge going. Uh, so you probably could go more like 3 to 1. Although the more you thin it down, the more coats you have to put on afterwards to build up a finish. So for this initial coat though, that worked out really, really well. Now you can probably see with a little, if I bring this in closer to you, you're going to be able to see that now this is still, it's pretty close to being completely dry for this coat. I mean, it's not cured of course, but you can see that there's a little bit of a white line here, a little bit here. I mean, this is all end grain that's on this edge here, which is why to me it's so important to do this wet sanding because it really smooths it out, you know, regardless of what grit I go to on that end grain when it's dry. When I'm doing it wet, that really makes a big difference because it's going to actually push particles into that end grain and that's going to help seal it up and kind of plug it up too. But these areas here are going to absorb a lot more. Now I did sand these really well so they are actually smooth, but that's just a natural function of the end grain. It just absorbs so much more of this finish back in. So uh, these are looking, they feel okay. This one here actually I could use a little bit more sanding so maybe on the next coat I'll go ahead and sand just this. I'll kind of cherry pick on the next coat to hit any places that don't feel just perfectly glass smooth and that's mostly just here and then this one right here for some reason I missed that. But otherwise it's looking really good, feels spectacular. Now for the drawers you're probably looking at this going wow that's really blotchy. You know because in a way blotch is an end grain absorbing more of a finish. Now, it turns out that that's just because these two here, I just finished them literally minutes ago. Uh, but these ones here have been drying longer, and you can see these ones here don't have that blotchiness, even though they have just as much end grain showing all over the place. Uh, once this stuff settles down, so maybe give this another 45 minutes or so, they'll all look pretty even, and you won't see any of this blotchiness that came through. Now, when you saw me doing the drawers, you saw that I was putting them basically upright on the side and kind of side sanding, so you, know, you put a lot of finish on one side and sand it down. That works relatively well. I didn't want it dripping on the drawer. and It wasn't very difficult to do that way, but one thing I did is for the second coat, instead of putting the drawer upright, I put the drawer upside down. So in a way it was giving me a different attack on the surface, and I, I, hopefully that will end up making it look better, uh, just because sometimes from the one side you're not going to see maybe a cusp that you didn't sand very well, but then when you flip it upside down it's plainly obvious. So, so far these just have the two wet sanded coats on them now with the varnish being thinned down as much as it is, I still have basically the equivalent of two-thirds of one coat on here. So I do need to put more. Generally what I like to do with the seal cell is now that I've got the sanding part done, the next coats are going to be really fast. Seal cell actually does set very, very quickly, so it's nice that you can get a lot of coats in in a day. Now I'm speaking from Arizona, so if you're in Florida, your mileage will vary. But I can put a number of coats on, like uh, I will probably put another one on before I go to bed, which for me is 3 a.m. Uh, on these and then tomorrow uh, around lunchtime or so I can come and put another one on and just repeat that for a couple times. I usually like to keep going with the seal of cell until it looks done and then after that I'll go to put something like armor seal on to set the correct sheen when I use something like armor seal satin or uh, you know if I was wanting to put more gloss on then I could put that on as well. Well now you're probably thinking I edited something from long ago back into this video for some reason but no actually this is where I'm at on the top segment. Uh, what happened when I had the original boards lined up for it, when I straight lined the board that was intended for this top segment to be sculpted, it was too narrow. So I went ahead and continued doing the sculpting and everything else thinking I'll catch up when I get it, I'll get a chance to just sculpt it on the weekend off camera, it goes fairly quickly off camera. Uh, but then between WIA, the Charles Neal event, and uh, in between those two I had a really big release for my day job, I never got a chance to do it. So that's what I'm doing this weekend, is I went ahead and I sculpted this board. Now the drawers have already been cut out of this, as you can see here. All I did is I took a Japanese saw and I cross cut up vertically on both of these pieces here until I got to the top. Now normally what I would have done there is simply taken my fret saw 
and cut across, but I lent my fret saw to a friend. So what I did instead was I took just a piece of ply, and this was all done from the back, right? I marked all the lines on the back. I took a piece of ply and I lined it up to where the line was going to be, and then I took this oscillating tool just to get it started. What I did is I placed it on the edge here and just plowed down straight through to make it pop out uh, through the top surface. After the oscillating tool popped through, what I did is I took a flush cut saw, pushed it into that opening that I just simply made, and I cut along the edge of the ply. Now the reason why I did that in two parts is twofold. One, I did a job recently with this and none of my blades are worth anything right now. So it was faster for me to do this than to go buy new blades. But second, you're coming in from the back with this blade. So when you bust through the front, you're going to get a lot of blowout or you can't. This drawer here didn't get too much. On the other one, the blowout is much more pronounced. It's nothing I can't sand away, especially with the sculpted exterior. But it's, it's a concern if you were doing this with a nicer hardwood that you wanted dead flat with crisp edges. So when I had the hole there, I then took the flush trim saw and pushed it basically through the kerf that I had opened up and then cut along the edge. Now when you're cutting this, I was cutting it from behind. So as I was pulling this saw through, of course, the cut was coming through from the front to the back. So any blowout is going to be on the back. So it made for a much cleaner cut on the front. Now the steps at this point, I have a little bit more work to do on the sculpting because I want to be able to sculpt these bottom edges. I want to make this part here where it's fatter. I want that to stick out a little bit further and these will be recessed back. Now this is a drawer front here, so actually I can't recess it up too far because the idea is that this is going to project down below the top segment and that's going to be the drawer pull. So this wood is fairly thin on the edge here. I mean, it's about a quarter inch, maybe uh, five sixteenths. And by the time I sculpt it to round it a bit, it's going to get even more narrow. And this grain, now if it was, if the grain was coming straight down and I was pulling on it, that's actually pretty strong. But when you're this way here where the grain is going horizontally, it's as if you're trying to break the grain apart. Like I could take this board on a good day and split it by pushing it like this with my thumbs. This way here, I would have almost no chance. So what I need to do is I'll need to do some reinforcing. The way I'm going to reinforce that is the same way that I did the reinforcement of the other handles. After this is sculpted from the underside in a place where you're not going to be able to see it, I'm going to drill some holes straight down and then I'll plug those with short pieces of the toothpicks. Now they'll be shorter, they won't come to the surface. The reason being is that after I've pushed them all the way in there with some epoxy, once it gums up a little bit, I'll simply give it a light sanding on here to cover up the epoxy so that if somebody ever takes the drawer out and looks underneath, yes, they'll see the dots of reinforcement, but they'll at least be mahogany colored instead of white toothpick colored. This piece of this drawer front had, when I uh, started to do the sculpting and stuff, I ended up revealing that there's a small crack in this. Now, I did fill the crack, you know, I just spread it a little bit with a wedge, forced some hide glue back in there and squeezed it. So it has been glued on the inside and it feels pretty solid, but because there was a crack there and it was revealed only after I did some sculpting, I went ahead and I added an additional two holes on either side of that so that they'll go through where the crack was and really reinforce that. Now people generally aren't going to be grabbing the drawer from these sides simply because it's actually awkward to do. There's not enough of a lip. The lip is intended to be here where the thick part is. So these still get a little bit of shaping still before we're done. So how this is going to work is exactly like I did before. I'm just going to be mixing up some epoxy, taking these toothpicks, but basically I'm going to be sticking this thing in, figuring out the depth of it, and then I'll end up clipping it so that this is going to be completely in the hole and then there'll just be a little bit of a tuft of uh, epoxy near the top to fill the hole so that when it gets gummed up, I can take just some 320, just lightly sand over the top of this to give it a little bit of sawdust into the epoxy. Uh, it'll be obvious if you flip the drawer over, but it's in a place that you're not really gonna see it too much and I'd rather have it be reinforced than not. So I'm working on the attachment of the front of the top segment 
And this is going to be screwed in as well. Like the other ones, they have panels on the side, and those are going to be screwed in a very similar fashion to this one. But since I'm doing this, I'll show you this part here right now. And the thing about the front is that there's a lot of these embossed regions that are a little bit thicker. Now what I'm going to plan on doing is trying to plant the screws in those locations. And I just want them to go through. They don't need to go very far because there's going to be a screw pretty much everywhere that there's an embossment that sticks out. So it'll be very well attached to this. Now, to remember, the reason why we're doing this by screwing it on is because the grain on this is going horizontally. So it's going to try expanding in the, you know, trying to get taller in a sense or shrinking. So you could get some wood movement issues. Now, in all honesty, on the size of this piece, I don't think there would have been any problem at all in just simply gluing it on. But since I was already planning on doing it on the lower segment, where it is very much a, a concern on the side, right? The side, if those panels were to expand and they were glued on, there would be all sorts of problems with the, the panels buckling or even cracking when they go to shrink. And honestly, here in Arizona, it tends to always go towards shrinking. It just keeps on getting smaller because it's so dry here. So the way that I've done this attachment so far is I've just used a Forstner bit to basically I just drop it until the Forstner bit's buried. So I'm just making a small socket. And I'm making a socket wherever there's one of these embossments after I clamped it onto the front. So when I just place this appropriately, I mean, I have these pieces of tape that line it up. This was something I put on actually before I put some finish on the back. Oh, that reminds me. There's already finish on the back. I already put a couple coats on there. So basically, I'm done with that part. Now, the tape was done so that I knew where the alignment was going to be when I got back to this step. So with these aligned, I buried the Forstner wherever at there was a thicker embossment through the back. Then I used a regular size bit. Now this bit here is big enough that the screw is going to be able to go in without having to be threaded through the hole. So in a way I want that somewhat elongated hole uh, wherever it's going through these members here. Now what I just finished doing is I just finished clamping this to the front and then I took this same bit that I drilled all the way through on these rails with, you know, with the front removed and then I just put it in there and then just started it so that the spur would leave a mark on the back of this top segment. So you can see here are the holes where I drilled all the way through and then when I drilled, just started doing the drilling, you can see some of the marks here from the spurs on those brad point bits. So that's where the screw is going to need to enter. So these are going to be pilots for the actual screws that are going to be entered. So they're going to be smaller so that the threads actually engage to hold the material to the case. So there's one other thing of interest on this top section. I have these edges that are pretty thin, right, from the sculpting. So this is only a, a little over a quarter inch, and there's a piece here that's about a quarter inch. There's just a little top part here that once it's sculpted, actually it'll go away. It's from a, an embossment that's on the front here. But the problem would be is that I'd be connecting something that's only a quarter inch thick to a piece here and it'd just be an end grain glue up. So there's not a heck of a lot of strength there. And I don't want to just, you know, screw it in and hope that there's no gap and, you know, that type of silliness. So what I ended up doing, and you can kind of see it here, I should have showed before I screwed all this on, is where there was that corner, I simply took a, a handsaw and I just handsawed down till there was only about a half inch down at the bottom and then I cut it out. So what I did is I cut out basically a triangle and then I cut a small triangular glue block that I've already attached to this other piece here. So this one here fits, you know, it fits very well inside that hole. It's not the same triangle I cut off. Uh, there would have been so little slack on that that I didn't want that. So this one here is actually smaller. But what this is going to do is now, when I screw this in, I'm also going to apply a little bit of epoxy here. So now instead of just having that quarter inch of end grain, I've actually got a strip here that's about uh, 5 eighths wide going down, and there's long grain on this one here to attach it to this piece. So once this thing here gets glued up and solidified, then tomorrow I'll be able to round this over with the RAS. I, I should have thought a little bit more about that ahead of time, but this works out just great. So uh, because of the half inch that I left here at the bottom, that's why the glue block only goes partially down. I wanted it so that when you look from the bottom, you would not be able to see it. coats of finish later, this is where we're at. I got, uh, I don't know how many total coats of seal -a cell it would probably be about three full strength coats because I was applying them pretty thin and sanding in the first several coats that were being applied. And then after that I've applied two coats 
of armor seal satin. Now those were not quite as thin. They were probably it's probably the equivalent of a coat and a half of armor seal satin. And I was mostly just to set this sheen, and you can see the sheen pretty well probably on this back item on the camera. This is going to look kind of shiny because it's on a raking light, but it looks very much like it's you know hand rubbed oil finish. It's it's beautiful for that, and it goes on very very well. The the flatteners that are in the armor seal satin really help it dry quickly, so it tends to dry faster than the dust is going to settle. So I didn't have too many dust nibs to deal with, although when you get to those final coats, what I find the most useful is to have a sheet of this white scotch bright. Now it's a really fine scotch bright, but then in between the coats, just go with the grain. And usually what I would do is if I was applying this, say, in the early evening, late at night before I went to bed, so you know it was definitely set up and drying, but it wasn't so dry that it was hard, then I would give it a light scuff because then I could remove any dust nibs very, very easily. So it made it so it's just perfectly smooth everywhere now. There were a few areas, like actually on the bottom of here, this is still drying because I applied just another swipe of, of finish on it. There was an area that, uh, with some of my mahogany, if you remember from the first episode when I was picking it, there's some mahogany that is really kind of had some pithy grain in certain areas. It was, it was kind of unusual, I've never had that, uh, but it was. A little bit of that was on this bottom part here. So even though you could sand it really smooth, it was only because the dust was packing into that pithy part. And then as soon as you hit it with a tack cloth or you wet sanded it, it all came out. So it was kind of rough down here. Now, if you remember, I went and worked with uh, Charles Neal down in Tucson, and he turned me on to this new product that he's been using called AquaCoat. Now, this is the clear grain filler. Uh, he gave me a can of it to give it a try. And actually, I have some experiments going on on the side that I'll be reporting on later. And it, it uses smoothing this exposed end grain that's everywhere here to see if it could have been done faster with this product. Uh, what I did is with that pithy part, I just applied some of the clear grain filler over top of that, uh, waited the half hour for it to set up, sanded it with some 220, and then a little bit with some 320, and then I just gave it a coat uh, of oil to, of the varnish oil mixture so that it'll be the same sheen as the outside, and it needs to be top coated. You can't just leave that on the surface. Uh, it worked very, very well. Now you can't even tell that that was the problem there. And what I'm doing in my experiment actually is because, as I mentioned before, this is all end grain that's being exposed here. So you got it all over the top of this board. It's very difficult to get that end grain to be very smooth. I was wet sanding, trying to push in the sawdust to fill it and make it nice and smooth. But it would have been nice to maybe do that kind of easily at first just to get the sawdust in everywhere, to get the coloring. And then afterwards, if it was still rough, hit it with some of this just coat it, do some quick sanding, and then it would have just been glass smooth. So that's actually what the experiment is on the side that I'll report on later. So at this point I'm going to do a little bit of pre-staging here in the shop. I'm going to drill the lead holes through this portion here of the bottom segment into the top segment. The way I'm going to do that is I'm simply going to clamp some boards on here to the top of those boards so that I can basically just set it down and it'll stop where I need it. And then I can drill the, the through holes in here the brad point is going to mark where I need to draw my pilots in the top segment. And then I can go take the top segment upstairs and go ahead and do that installation separately. Because there's a lot of little lag bolts to put into the walls and such. And once that's there, it'll be easier for me to then concentrate on putting the bottom segment up. And then we'll take a look and see what it looks like when it's all done. Now lastly, while I'm here, I, a long time ago I picked up this bottle of spray Brie Wax. And I thought, well, it's probably going to be a very useful thing to have around. And I'm glad I do have it because for this... While I could apply paste wax everywhere, it's a real nuisance to get into all these little nooks and crannies that are everywhere. I uh, am definitely going to use, you know, this is more expensive per ounce for sure than a paste wax. But for this type of a project, it's going to be nice to be able to just spray it. It'll get evenly into all the areas, let it dry, and then I can just buff it with a cloth later and it'll just look fantastic. So uh, let me get to this installation.
be able to see this very well with the lighting in here. This is all shimmed to the wall and bolted to it. Now, what I'm trying to do now is attach these side panels. So I simply clipped it to, clamped it to the front here so that it's flush because that's basically the correct position. And I have a little clamp over there that's just lifting it up off the floor. And I'm marked on the back here, looking at some of these fatter areas, I've marked special divots in the back here so that I know where I can put longer screws so I get a bit better purchase. But there are a lot of small screws that are going to go here along the front that are just going to go a little ways in just to snug it up and hold it there. So, you know, basically by, by having a number of screws, I'll have this thing well attached to the sides. And that's going to go on onto both sides. So once I get that done, then we'll go ahead and put it all together and then I'll show you what it looks like. So the way I'm going to screw that in is I've gone over on the back here and you can see that I've made a number of holes through the plywood in various places. For the most part, there's two in each one of the slots near the back and then near the front. Those are going to be some shallow 5 8 screws that are just going to go through and they're going to pull about 3 16 of that wood in. So it's going to be able to hold it there. The volume of nail, uh, the volume of screws is going to keep it tight. There are a few other ones like this one here and then that there and these are in some of the larger embossments so there I'll be able to use a larger screw uh, to make sure that I get a good purchase on that. Uh, frankly if you had all these 5 8 ones there you can have 8 on one side, 8 on the other and then I've got a total of 4 across the top so you know an additional one. That, those would be plenty to hold that panel there. There isn't any weight on it it's just holding it there so that there can be wood motion. Now the way this top has been attached, there is unfortunately no stud in the wall back here, but the granite is ridiculously enforced. It's not going to have any problem with deflection on this side. Here is that cleat that I had. I put a lag bolt directly into the stud that's behind here. And then back into this corner, I had to put a shim board because this wall is horribly out of square. And then lag bolt all the way through to lock that into place. Now this drawer here, if you slide the drawer all the way out, you'll see that what I did is I placed just an off-cut of mahogany flat and level with a lag bolt going into that extra 2x4 that I put in the drywall before doing this whole assembly. That was back in, I believe, episode 7 where I showed you how I was going to put that in there. Uh, I, could have put a, I could have put a single lag bolt through here, but it was much easier to put this board here after I leveled it, put it straight away in, and then I could put a single screw here down into that cleat to lock it into position and it's definitely solid. I put all my weight on this top after I had this bottom one shimmed and uh, it didn't move. Now here what I did is there's a 2x4 back there that happens to be the exact thickness that I needed for a shim between the wall so there's a lag bolt that goes into the one stud. I only got one stud back there I can use so I've got a lag bolt going into that and then two lag bolts here locking that back rail into the 2x4. So that's going to keep it from pivoting and also keep it from being able to push itself back because it's about an inch and a half away from that back wall due to, due to the way I installed it. Now here I did cut out that one rail that I was not able to, you know, I couldn't keep that there. That was the reason why this was to be inserted, this middle section, was so that I could possibly dodge some of the uh, plumbing, but that one happened to be exactly where the rail was, so I cut it. It's not going to make any difference on the strength. It's not needed for the drawers. The drawers don't even go back that far. Uh, that was just an attachment point if necessary. Back here, there's another 2x4. This one here has a very small thin shim of wood between it to make it so that it was snug. Uh, again, it's got a bolt there. It goes into the wall, and then there's two lag bolts that hold the rail in place. Now, uh, if you look at this top segment here, there's four screws along each of the sides. Right now, I just have four in place, uh, holding it there somewhat temporarily because... The plan is that I'll be removing this later so that we can do a better job on the plumbing. So it's uh, getting very close. It looked good when I put all the drawers in. They moved very, very well. These drawers here have a little bit of tightness. Uh, right now we've had a whole week of drizzling rain, which is unusual for this. And it's a little bit snug right here, only at the end when you close the, the drawer. So you know, give it a little bit of a push and it comes right out and it moves fine. But then just at that end, right there, it gets snug. Now, I'm not going to change anything on this drawer or the other drawer yet because once I put the granite on there, it's possible it's going to press down a little bit on this and that might need a little bit more relief on this drawer in order to make it roll nicely. So I'm not going to worry about that until that time. 
a heavy handheld, so I apologize for any shakes. It's been a while since I had coffee, but uh, you never know. So this is the look of the granite sculpted side, uh, you know, when you might be busy. And while everything that you saw in the shop is really this view right here, straight on, so it looks almost like you've got... To me, when you're looking at this straight on, especially after the finish was on, it almost looks like, say, a backbone. You know, you've got segments going up and down. Uh, but of course, the real view is this one. When I'm here, this is the look that I get. So it's nice that there's all the undulations. And in fact, everybody that's come over and seen it uh, before the granite was on, they just spent all their time just feeling the finish because I've made this, I, I took a lot of extra time to make sure that this was glass smooth. So I'm really happy with it. This is one of these nicer little trough faucets, which I've always liked. Uh, it dulls the pressure down a little bit so it doesn't come spitting out at me. But. So one of the later projects I will be working on is I'm just going to make a backsplash here. It's just going to be just take the board, undulate it with the, the RAS. I'll have to scoop back behind the faucets, but I'll do three scoops there so it'll look, it should look kind of nice. It'll kind of frame it. Uh, and then there's the plug that I'll be creating a socket out of for, uh, well, right into the backsplash. So a bit of a different angle, got you in the bathtub. Uh, what I wanted to go over now are just, just briefly sort of observations I had after doing the project. This isn't something I've ever done before. So there are some things that I liked about the way that I did it, and some things that surprised me about how it came out. So I thought I would just go and review some of the observations that I had. Now, these handles, I really like them. They've been well received with people as far as being kind of creative. So one of the things I think I would try to do differently, and I'm not sure how I would do differently, but uh, one thing is that when you look at the top of the drawers, I can see the cuts for pulling out this center piece here to make this into the three parts of the drawers. Now, on most of these, they're actually not too bad. They don't show that much, and really, you only see it when you pull out the drawer. But it seems like it'd be nice if there'd be a way that you could do this type of sculpting without having to actually cut these pieces away. Uh, one way possibly would be to, you know, drill a hole in here and then use the fret saw to cut it out, scoop it out. But then that would leave this portion here where I use the, the rabbiting router bit. It would leave that to, I don't know, what other method could you use? You might be able to use a bit from the back side. It seems like it'd be a whole lot more work to do it that way there. So maybe something better would just be to perhaps when you make this, you cut off a, sl a very thin slice of this panel before uh, you cut out the parts for the drawer. You would do this glue up, you would have the little gap, but then you would glue that strip along the top. And if the grain was very well matched, I mean, you cut it off this piece, right? So if you're cutting it with something very, very thin, like a thin cutting 16th inch kerf blade, uh, you should be able to put it back and maybe that would be more hidden. Not altogether sure but uh, it, would be, it would be worth trying. Or possibly if you made that strip on a bevel in the back and then reattached it. So that way there the glue line would be here on the top as opposed in the front, right? You'd be, in, in a sense, exaggerating. You would cut this at a bevel like this. You're only cutting a very thin shaving, but you're gonna take that all the way across because that bevel would be about midway on the thickness of this board. Well, that would have covered these here. So I'm thinking that that would actually be how I would want to do it if I did it a second time, uh, which isn't looking very likely. <laughs> but I like the way the handles came out. I mean, my friend who did, the, the plumber who did the installation, he really likes this and he was looking going, so you're not going to put hardware on this, are you? And it's like, no, the drawer handles are you know, here and here. So, you know, he liked that look. Uh, it makes it a little bit sleeker. It's nice that this is all nice and rounded. And I did like the way that the rounding came out. I think if I were to do this again, I wouldn't bother making it the two sec segments. It did make it a little bit handier in the shop. Uh, if I did it like that in the shop, what I would do though is I would pre-attach it all in the shop and not even worry about adjusting the depth. So I could have gotten the panels on there and like fully attached at the point where I did the sanding because the backs were already finished. So I could have done all the sanding with the drawers, everything all assembled and then hit it with the first couple coats of finish. And I think it would have sped it up a little bit. Whether that would make a big deal or not, it wasn't like a huge encumbrance, but I think it makes a, a bit of a difference. Well, I'm glad you stuck it out and had all the patience to get through all these, what feels like a bazillion episodes. Uh, I think the product came out really nice, and hopefully you got some little ideas along the way. They generated some ideas for you. 
and whatnot. Uh, the next couple projects I'm going to do are going to be more like Christmas presents because I don't have any right now and I need to put some together. So hopefully there'll be some really short episodes coming up soon. Thanks a lot. I'm Paul Marcel.